Hello everybody, my name is Rachel and today I'm going to talk about the books I read in the first two weeks of May. I haven't been reading as voraciously as I usually do this month, but I still have some catch up to do because I have neglected to do my regular weekly wrap ups. So let's get into it. The first thing that I read in May was An Uncommon Reader by Alan Bennett. This is a novella that reads quite a bit like a play to me. In fact, I think that Bennett may be a playwright. But this is about how the current Queen of England comes across a mobile library on the palace grounds and checks out a book to be polite. And all of a sudden, the Queen is a reader. She's reading all the time, voraciously, and not only does she want to read all the books, she wants to talk about them, she wants to have conversations with people about what she's reading and what they're reading, and wants to get book recommendations and recommend things to other people. And this conflicts with her role and with her duties. I don't think there's any particular reason why the main character of this is the Queen of England, other than that she has a life which is very at odds with personal indulgence. I do think, for me, the whole point of this was just to show what the reader's life might look like a bit from the outside, and how one's life can be changed quite radically by reading books. I didn't get much more out of it than that, however. I was a little bit nonplussed, perhaps is the word, at how much the queen does not resemble the real queen. Like, to base this on a real person felt a bit odd for me because she says and does and decides some things which I'm pretty sure the real queen would never do. The ending of this story has her make a decision which I don't think the real queen would even contemplate. And that kind of yanked me out of this, like maybe I've just watched The Crown too many times or too many little documentaries about the British royal family or something. I just, I didn't quite get the difference between the fictional version and the real version and what, what the point of that was. But other than that, it was a very short, quick, and lovely read, very much for people who love books. Mythago Wood by Robert Holdstock. This is a mythic fantasy novel from the 1980s, and I really enjoyed this type of fantasy with the emphasis on myth and legend and contemporary people interacting with the past, basically. I really love that. I love the premise. The characters, however, let me down. <laughs> so, to describe this, this is about the struggle between two brothers over a mythical woman that they fall in love with. The wood of the title is Ryhope Wood. The two brothers, Stephen and Christian, grow up next to the wood with their father who is obsessed with it and their mother who's slowly fading away. Their father seems very cold and distant from his family. His obsession takes him away from them constantly, and so they don't have a very good relationship with their father. After World War II, um, Stephen returns from France uh, when he learns that his father has died and his brother Christian wants him to come home. He does and discovers that Christian now knows the secret of the wood, and he tells Stephen what's been going on. The wood is magical. It is bigger on the inside than the outside, and like the TARDIS, if you go into it, it will take you to other times, other places where you will meet other peoples. It is defensive, it tries to repel people, so it's very difficult to get into the wood. It's even di more difficult to get into the heart of the wood, where the most interesting things are happening. When humans, when people like Christian and Stephen and their father are in the wood for a long enough time, their, what's described as racial memory, generates mythagos. The wood creates real people out of these myths and archetypes embedded in people's memories, basically. To make these things that people have internalized over the eons to bring them into reality so that you can interact with them again is a wonderful idea. It's your dreams come to life. And the tension here is that the father fell in love with a mythago 
um, Gwyneth. When he dies, Christian falls in love with Gwyneth as well, but his own version, a mythago that he's created. And then Stephen shows up, and he also falls in love with his own mythago version of Gwyneth. This is a very classic story of brother fighting against brother over a woman. And the, the problem here is she's perfect. She's literally the perfect woman that embodies what each of these men wants because they've created her out of their own minds. The way that the men act in this was just uh, so frustrating. I, I, Christian is meant to be kind of the villain of the story. He does some terrible things. He becomes a bad person. But Stephen, I thought I might like him, but there was just something very off-putting about him. His immediate obsession with this woman is a little disturbing. The, the focus on what she looks like, her body, he wants to be with her, and there's really not that much question of whether she wants him as well. Of course she's going to want him. She's perfect for him. She's going to desire him. But I feel like she really didn't have much agency. She seems like she's supposed to be a very independent and strong and badass person. But what it comes down to is men fall in love with her and then fight over her. And this journey into the wood is fascinating. The descriptions, oh my goodness, this, the, the author describes smells so much in this. I felt like I was actually in this forest and it was beautiful but also creepy, wonderful but also terrifying. It embodies all sorts of woods that have ever existed. It was, it was fantastic. But every time that focus shifted back to the characters, Stephen chasing after Christian, Christian trying to get Gwyneth away, I just wasn't into that. I was very off-putting. But I will certainly be reading the second book. There's a sequel, Lavandis, that I also own a copy of, and I would like to read it. Um, it. It concerns different characters, but the same wood, and I would love to be back in this setting with maybe a different type of story that could make all the difference in the world. So I would actually recommend this one a lot, especially if you're interested in reading a different type of fantasy. Um, I just think that the idea in this one, the premise of it, is really, really great. Next, I read a couple of comics. I finally got my hands on Gotham Academy Volume 2. This is written by Becky Cluden, and the artwork is by various people. I thought the artwork was fine. I really like the cast of characters. That's what impressed me most in the first volume. But this second one was written atrociously. I thought the writing was just bad. It was clunky and messy and jarring. There were terrible transitions between scenes, action was confusing, it was just a mess. It did not make much sense. It was so rushed. I was really disappointed in it and I'm just not going to continue. There's a third volume. I haven't heard that it's any better than this one, so I'm done. And then I read volume five of Lazarus. I think this volume is called Cole and it's written by Greg Rucka. I really like the series. It's kind of an outlier for me because it's one of the more graphic violent series that I actually enjoy. Not really indicative of my usual taste in comics. I'm usually more of like a Lumberjanes to Giant Days type of person, you know? Um, but I, I'm really invested in the story of the main character here. This is an apocalyptic type of setting. It's in the future when financially the world has collapsed and only a small handful of families have all the wealth and power in the world. And most of the world's population are classified as waste. They're completely abandoned. And the families are now embroiled in a war to take over each other's territory and such. Every family has converted one of their family members into what's called a Lazarus, which is basically a super soldier. The story focuses on Forever, who is the Lazarus for the Carlisle family, and it kicks off when Forever receives an anonymous message that she is not actually related to the family, that they've been lying to her. So she doesn't really know who she is or even really what she is. She is the best Lazarus, but why has the family been lying to her? 
Volume 5 was great because it really moves the story along. There's some really good plot progress with what Forever knows, how she has acted on that, and that the family now knows that she knows and they are split down the middle on how they want to handle that and it could go really badly. I don't know when volume six is gonna come out, but hopefully soon, because I feel like the story is really working its way to the end and I, I'm ready for the conclusion, the showdown, the answers. I finally dove into the Moomin Family series by Tova Janssen. These are some pretty classic, well-loved books for younger readers about the Moomin family. The main family is Moomin Papa, Moomin Mama, and their son Moomin Troll, and then all the other characters are their friends who come to live with them and they're like one big happy family having adventures. The first book, Comet and Moomin Land, introduces most of the characters. Um, Moomin Troll goes off on an adventure with his friend Sniff to go find an observatory on top of the highest mountain to see a comet which is coming towards Earth and is going to probably crash into the valley where the Moomins live. The second story is Finn Family Moomin Troll. I don't understand the, the English translation of this title. I think a more accurate translation is like The Magician's Hat, which makes a lot of sense because the story is about, I think what's called the Hobgoblin's Hat in the English translation. Um, the Moomin family finds it and when you put things into the hat, they turn into other things hijinks ensue, and eventually the hobgoblin or the magician comes looking for his hat again. I think these are just really lovely stories about family. I don't have much to say about the books, honestly. I just think they were lovely. I enjoyed reading them. And it was weirdly like being a child again, except that I don't think I really loved the Moomin books when I was a kid, so there's not nostalgia there. They're just... They're just really good stories. And lastly, I read Everyone's an Alien When You're an Alien 2 by Jomini Sun. This is nominated for the Booktube SFF Awards in the graphic work category, and that was the first time I ever heard of it. Though I think it's kind of like an internet webcomic sensation with a, a book version finally coming out. This is about a little odd alien named Jomini who is left on Earth by the other aliens to learn more about humans and he wanders around very naively making friends with trees and bees and birds and he thinks that they're all human beings. It's cute and uplifting and I think it wants to be kind of philosophical and give you good messages about life and friends and being happy and everything. I'm not super fond of the art style. It's fine, it's cute, but it's not my favorite thing ever. Um, my main problem with this is that there are tons of intentional misspellings. It's, it's for an effect, of course, but I am trained to notice and fix typos and misspellings. I just can't turn that part of my brain on and off at will. I knew that was going to be a mild irritation when I went into this and I was right. So like I said, it was cute and fun and very quick to read. I didn't really get much out of it, but I bet that if you read this at the right time when you really needed something uplifting, it would really help your mood. And that is it for this batch of books. Do let me know if you've read any of these or if you want to and what your thoughts are. Thank you very much for watching and I'll be back soon to talk to you again. And until then, bye.